We're now going to discuss how we would actually deal with polymorphism by using interfaces. In some of our labs, what we're going to see is that one of the main uses of interfaces is to allow GUI programs to handle more than one type of event, such as Windows events, mouse events, action events. So each of those would be handled by separate interfaces. So for example, we would have an interface that takes care of the Windows events, we would have an interface that takes care of the mouse events, we would have an interface that takes care of the action events. So GUI is a, a great way to use interfaces and we'll do more of that in the labs. Now an interface can also be used for implementing abstract data types. We talked a little bit about this in CS121, I think very briefly. We're gonna be doing a lot more things with abstract data types in this class. So if you remember, an abstract data type or an ADT is basically this thing that's defined by the data that it can store and the operations that we can perform on it. I know that thing is not really the best way to describe it, but you can think of it as this unit where we can decide what type of data can actually be stored in there and we can decide what kind of operations or actions we can perform on that particular data. And that's basically what an abstract data type is. And what's nice about it is we can actually use a class to implement an abstract data type. So like some languages such as C++, we can't separate the definition of a class from the definition of its methods. So if the user of a class would look at the definition of the class, then the user can also look at the definitions of the methods. So it would, the user would actually see the implementation details of a class. So what we're finding here is that we cannot separate the implementation details from the specification details. Well, we want this. We want to be able to separate the specification from the implementation. The way I usually describe it in, in class is think of the specification as what we want to do and the implementation is how we would go about doing that. So what we want to do with our classes is we want to separate what we want to do from how we want to do it. Separate the what from the how. So how do we actually go about separating the what from the how? Well, in Java, what we would do is we would create our interface and that would contain only the method headings or the name constants. So the, the interface would contain the what portion of it. And then we would create another class that would implement the interface. So what we're seeing here is if we look at that interface, we would see what operations can be, per be performed, but we wouldn't see how those operations are actually being done. We would only see that if we would look at the class that implements the interface. And quite frankly, we're not really worried about this. We don't, we're not really concerned with how things are being implemented. The programmer will take care of that. And then if we're trying to deal with the actual operations or if we're trying to create our abstract data type, we only want to call the appropriate methods from the interface and let the class take care of the details. Like for example, uh, whenever you write your programs and you use methods from the math class, are you concerned about what the PAL method does or the ABS method does? Probably not. You know what it does. You know the PAL method is going to raise something to some power. You know the ABS method is going to give you the absolute value. You don't have to look at the class definition to see how it's actually being done. You just know what's being done. We're doing the same thing here. So we have our interface that contains all of the method headings. So we know what the operations are, but we're not worried about how it's actually being done. Just as we can create polymorphic references to classes in an inheritance hierarchy, uh, we can also create polymorphic references using interfaces. So what we can do is we can use an interface name as the type of a reference variable, and then the reference variable can point to any object of any class that implements the interfaces. So we're not limited to using polymorphic references for inheritance stuff. We can use it for interfaces as well. However, there's one thing to keep in mind. Because an interface contains only method headings and or named constants, we cannot create an object of an interface. Okay, we still have to make sure that we create a class that implements the interface but we cannot instantiate an object of an interface. Let's take a look at an example. 
let's say we're doing an interface for an employee. So in here, we would have two abstract methods. We have a wages method and we have a department method. So the wages method will take care of, of dealing with the wages. The department would give us the name of the department. Now we are allowed to declare a reference variable using the interface. So in this case, I can create a reference variable of type employee, even though employee is an interface. So I can do something like this employee and then maybe new employee. This is perfectly fine. Now let's suppose I have the following statement, uh, maybe something like new employee, and then I want to sign it a new employee. So we're pretty much invoking the constructor. We're creating an object of that interface. This is illegal. We're not allowed to do this because once again, we cannot instantiate an object of the interface. Now let's suppose that we had two classes that implemented the employee interface. So maybe we have a class that deals with part-time employees and then another class that has full-time employees. And just as a reminder, the, both of these classes implement the employee interface. So with these classes, we can create objects of either one of these classes. So if we go back to our earlier example with the new employee, I could set it equal to new full-time. So here I create an object of the full-time class and store that in the new employee reference variable. That I am allowed to do. So we can have a reference variable of the interface type and have it store the address of an object of a, a class that implements the interface. So this is perfectly fine. So then what this means is we can invoke the defined methods of the class. So now I can use new employee to invoke methods from the full-time class. So for example, I could have uh, a salary variable and I sign it the result of new employee dot wages. So here I would call the wages method from the full-time class. There is some definition in there. It does some stuff, take the result and I store it in the salary uh, variable. Now there is an issue with this if we're not careful. So let's suppose that the full-time class has an additional method and we'll call it update pay rate. So this is a method that's in the full-time class, but it's not an abstract method from the employee interface. So let's say we try to run new employee dot update pay rate and pass some value. We're actually going to get a compile error. And the reason is because remember new employee is a reference variable of type employee. So it can point to an object of full-time or part-time. That's not the issue, but the problem is that it can only guarantee that the object that it points to can use the methods wages and department. So when I use new employee, I don't know that whether it's dealing, I don't know whether it's dealing with the full-time class or the part-time class. We don't, we don't know that for sure. So we don't know if we can even use, update pay rate. So the compiler is going to look at it and go at this point, I don't know if it's actually dealing with the full-time class or part-time class. So I'm just going to throw a compiler error because I don't know which one it is. There is a way around it though. So if we do know what new employee is pointing to, so if we know that it is pointing to an object of full-time, then we can use an appropriate cast operator. We can actually typecast the new employee variable to the full-time class and then call the appropriate method. So we can do something like this. So we would have to put it in parentheses because this whole thing is going to be the object. So this whole thing right here is our object. And notice that what we did is we typecast new employee to full time. So what that does is says that this whole thing is an object of the full time class. So then when I invoke the update pay rate on that object, we're perfectly fine because we know that this is in fact an object of the full time class. Now we're not limited to just this one type of class that implements a particular interface. Uh, we can actually create additional classes that would implement the employee. So we could have subclasses of full-time or part-time, or we can break it down, for example, to maybe employees that are on a fixed salary and then maybe another subclass where they're paid by the hour. You know, we can do uh, subclasses that involve types of employees. So maybe like board members. Um, so we can expand the hierarchy however we want. So we can actually have more classes that would implement the employee interface.
And we can also uh, use an interface um, to have a, a parameter for a method. So we can have methods where the interface names would be parameters for that. So how do we do that? Well, let's say we have a class that imp implements an interface. And then let's say we have a reference variable that points to an object of the class that implements an interface. Well, we can pass that reference variable as an argument to a method. So we're just saying here that any reference variable of any class that implements that interface can be passed as an argument to that method.